USAF's Forgotten Flying Wing is a heavy bomber. The much-anticipated B-21 Raider, which is being developed by Northrop Grumman based on Hugo Junker's patent application for a hollow body, will be the first Air Force bomber created in the 21st century. It is named in honor of the legendary Doolittle Raiders who bombed Tokyo, Japan in April 1942. But the idea of the flying wing dates back to the early 1900s, more than a century ago. Hugo Junkers, an aeronautical engineer from Germany, first submitted a patent application for the airplane with a flying wing design on February 1, 1910. Only a few months later, British Army Lieutenant John William Dunn achieved sustained flight with his tailless, swept-wing model D-5 for a distance of just over two miles. This made the aircraft the first flying wing in history. Want to know more? Hey guys, welcome back to our channel, Future Warplanes, where we tell you about military fighter jets, military drones, and military planes from the currently famous in the air to the most advanced around the world. So stay with us till the end of this video so you don't miss out on any of this information. But before we proceed, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and click on the bell icon so you don't miss out on any of our amazing videos in the future. And let's begin. Four years after this flight, the American aircraft maker Burgess Company constructed Dunn's successor model D-8 for both the U.S. and international markets. Army and Navy, with the latter having floats for landing on water. One passenger on the Burgess D-8 remarked on how stable and easy to manage the aircraft was. The man most responsible for turning the flying wing idea into a reality in the United States was the aircraft designer John Jack Northrop. The flying wing's initial allure stemmed from its ability to reduce drag. Engineers were able to do away with the tail section by distributing weights uniformly over the wings of an airplane rather than up and down a conventional fuselage. Jack Northrup created a remarkable flying wing in the 1940s that flew like an airplane but didn't look like one, at least not the conventional sense. This invention caused a great deal of excitement. It proved that an airplane could fly without a tail or a fuselage. The wing was adequate. In fact, in July 1940, during a high-speed taxi test on a dry lake bed in the California desert, Northrop's small-scale N1M, which was the company's first real flying wing, took off on its own. Before the pilot could land it, it had hit a rough place, bounced 10 feet into the air, and flown several hundred feet. Although Northrop was not the first to conceptualize an all-wing aircraft, he went considerably further than anyone else. The Air Force considered his XB-35 to be a potential replacement for the B-29, its greatest bomber of World War II in the middle of the 1940s. In June 1946, the XB-35, a massive boomerang-shaped aircraft with a wingspan of 172 feet, made its first flight. It was propelled forward by four sets of counter-rotating propellers installed on the trailing edge. In 1947, the YB-49, an XB-35 with a jet engine, was released. The flying wing was often mistaken for a flying saucer in claims of UFO sightings because, when viewed head-on, it appeared to resemble one. It frequently showed up in newsreels and photo spreads in well-known periodicals, which created public fascination. The flying wing, however, was plagued with significant technical and operational issues. The propeller's opposite rotation never performed effectively. The YB-49 struggled constantly with flying instability. The Air Force's 1949 decision to cancel the YB-49 is controversial. Flying wing technology was thought to be extinct and inactive, but the flying wing made a comeback as a contender for the advanced technology bomber in the late 1970s. The instability issues had been resolved by fly-by-wire technology, and the flying wing provided a benefit that had proved to be crucial. It was very challenging to be detected by radar. The early days of aviation sparked interest in a flying wing. It was known that an airplane's fuselage and tail gave it stability and control, but that they also generated drag and decreased aerodynamic efficiency. In 1908, the D-4 powered all-wing aircraft made its first flight in Britain. The British Army commander, John William Dunn, who created it, said that it was more of a hopper than a flyer. It was a V-shaped biplane. Other companies, most notably Walter and Reimer Horton in Germany, created more sophisticated flying wing aircraft, but John Knudsen Northrop's invention was the first to fully realize the idea. In addition to the School of Hard Knocks, Northrop noted that his education in grammar in high school was his only formal schooling. I did not enroll in college. 
Despite having no formal schooling, he went on to become regarded as one of the most important aircraft designers of the 20th century, despite not having any correspondence courses or anything of that sort. In Santa Barbara, California, he started working as a draftsman for the Lockheed Brothers, who had not yet altered their name spelling to Lockheed. He collaborated with Ryan Aircraft on the Spirit of St. Louis, an aircraft that Charles Lindbergh used to fly from New York to Paris, and was the primary designer of the iconic Lockheed Vega monoplane in the 1920s. In fact, the aircraft was designed around a sizable enlarged wing in which the pilot sat, but twin outrigger booms ran rearward to a normal tail assembly, giving it the nickname Flying Wing in aviation periodicals of the time. The N1M, short for Northrop First Mockup, was his first actual flying wing, and it was created in 1940, by which time he was in charge of his own aviation business. The N1M was a tiny test platform with a wingspan of only 38 feet that was primarily made of wood to facilitate simple configuration modifications. The rudders and other control surfaces were incorporated into the wing itself. In 1941, the Air Corps requested an aircraft design study as a result of the N1M test results being excellent enough to warrant it. The B-29 bomber, which was then under development, was predicted to perform better than the bomber proposed by Northrop, Consolidated Aircraft and Boeing, which had a range of 6,000 miles and a top speed of 450 miles per hour. The XB-35 prototype bomber was designed by Northrop, and it was a huge sweeping sweep of polished metal. It was gorgeous and incredibly magnificent. The trailing edges of the wings were equipped with all the flight controls, including elevons that served as both ailerons and elevators, and flaps that served as rudders. The crew nacelle, the fuel tanks, and the bomb bays were all inside the wing, although there were a few lumps and blisters on top, including the plexiglass bubble over the pilot seat and a smaller one for the navigator to take sightings. It was thick enough at 85.5 inches at the root cord to give a typical crew of nine ample restricted cockpit space. Although it appeared futuristic, the XB-35 was not. Ahead of its time for 1941, the design was nonetheless caught at a transition point in aeronautics, between the period of the propeller and the jet, as Hallian put it. Several XB-35s had the propellers replaced with eight jet engines in a variation known as the YB-49 in an effort by Northrop and the Air Force to ease the changeover. Of all the Northrop flying wings, it was unquestionably the most attractive. For stability, four fixed vertical fins were attached on the trailing edges, and four air dams or shallow fences ran from the front to the back to help direct airflow. Although Northrop did not like the intrusive fins, they did, in a little way, contribute to the sleek aspect of the aircraft. In October 1947, the YB-49 made its debut flight. Although it increased somewhat in top speed, the additional weight of the jet engines considerably decreased both the range and the bomb load. Hallian added that it had mission-limiting stability issues that made it unsuitable for a bombing platform. Hey, that's going to end today's episode. We hope that you enjoyed our video for today. If you did, please make sure you subscribe and leave a comment down below to let us know your thoughts about our video. And don't forget to subscribe and make sure you like today's video. And we'll see you in our next one. Thanks for watching and have a great day.